we will be looking at uh, the Joker in this film um, and ask the question, is he a superhero? Is he a superhero? And also, is the film something you can consider as a superhero film? The way we'll do that is that we will consider the film as well as its main character using uh, theories by Peter, sorry, uh, that's meant to say Peter, Peter Coogan, not Cooper, my bad, and uh, Jeffrey A. Brown here. We will take their ideas and some ideas from other people in order to investigate the film as a superhero film, see if it fits within the superhero genre, as well as see if the, the Joker character can be considered a superhero himself. Um, and after we have defined these things, we will uh, try to analyze the film along with the character. And after we've uh, done that, I will give my little conclusion. And then we will afterwards have a, a discussion in, in Danish, of course. Um, if it hasn't, it has been set, but of course, once again, spoiler alert, because we have to go through the whole film and I have to talk about the character and how he acts in the film, it means that there will be spoilers for the whole film. We will start with the definition of superhero and genre. And to do this, we will first of all look at the superhero character himself. And we will analyze him with uh, what Peter Coogan refers to as the MPI model. Uh, yes, which is what he wrote about in this little book of his right here, Superhero, The Secret Origin of Genre. Very good book, I can recommend it. He uh, mainly talks about superheroes in connection to comic books, mind you, so not necessarily specifically with, with films. Now, MPI model refers to mission, power, and identity. These are the three things that makes the superhero character. Um, they're kind of self-explanatory for the most part. Mission, the selfless intent, means that the superhero is doing something um, that, is benef that benefits other people more so than themselves. The, um, of, it's basically just their motivation, what do they want to do, pretty much. Power, self-explanatory, the extraordinary power, the superpower of the superhero character. And then we have identity, and this is the one we, we have to talk a little bit about. Identity is, consists, consists of codename, costume, and chevron. These three things, they make up the identity of the, the superhero character. So, to look at this, uh, you asked what a Chevron is. Yeah. Chevron is basically the superhero symbol or logo. It's um, Superman's S and it's Batman's Bat symbol. It's what you recognize the character by. You look at the symbol, you look at the icon, you look at the Chevron and you recognize, oh, that's, that's Batman. Boom, there you go. So once again, they're kind of self-explanatory. Code name is, of course, the name of the character. Costume, costume is a little interesting. Costume is the superhero's appearance. And there is a very specific way the character has to look like. The character, as, it's, as it says here, uh, the superhero costume removes the specific details of a character's ordinary appearance, leaving only a simplified idea that is represented in the colors and design of the costume. Um, the idea is basically, and that's also basically what McCloud here says with amplification through simplification. The idea is you can take that, sorry, this is Superman, that's Batman, you can take Superman's color scheme, blue, red, and yellow, and just look at those three colors, that's sort of part of the palette, just see them next to each other, and you will immediately think of Superman. Same thing can be said about Batman, his gray, his yellow, and his black. The colors are simplified, the design is simple enough for you to recognize it, and also for it to be replicated. The most important thing to be said about the identity of the superhero is that there needs to be a connection mostly between costume and code name. I say that because Chevron is not always accounted for. If you were to use Batman as an example, Batman is named Batman and he looks like he is dressed as a bat for a specific reason. He was uh, terrified of bats growing up and now he uses that as, his, uh, as part of his superhero identity. So that's why he's called Batman and that's why he's, he's dressed like a bat because it is connected to his um, personality. So. It wouldn't make any sense if he was named Jeff uh, as his superhero name. That would be silly, of course. Moving on, we have some exceptions when talking about the MPI model. 
As Kogan says here, a superhero can still be a superhero despite not completely matching MPI as long as it still fits within the superhero genre. So basically, and here there are some examples of this, and you might have thought to yourself, well, Batman doesn't have any superpowers, so he wouldn't be a superhero. Batman is still a superpower, uh, sorry, still a superhero despite not having any powers. The Hulk is still a superhero despite not having a clear mission, a clear goal due to him being a monster. The Fantastic Four, according to Coogan, do not have a clear superhero identity. Apparently Stan Lee, uh, he quotes Stan Lee in, uh, in the book and says that Stan Lee created the Fantastic Four with the intent of making superheroes who doesn't have a clear superhero identity. Their identity is the same as their own regular uh, characters. Another thing that needs to be said is um, you might be thinking that there are some characters you can think of that do not, sorry, that uh, can be fitted within the MPI model. Characters who may have a mission, a specific set of powers, and a specific identity. However, there are characters who can be fitted within it, but because they're not supported by the superhero genre, that means that they are still not superheroes, according to Peter Coogan. So if the story they appear in does not belong to the superhero genre, then they're not a superhero themselves. Uh, Coogan uses Buffy the Vampire Slayer as an example of that. She has a mission to kill vampires, to slay vampires. Her powers is, um, I believe she, I, I never watched the show, but I believe it's something of, <laughs> I know, I know it's on Netflix or something, but I don't have time. <laughs> Uh, she has some superpowers related to dealing with, with vampires, and her identity is the Slayer. That's at least her, her code name. So one could make the argument that she would be a superhero, but because the show fits within the horror genre and makes references to the horror genre, and also apparently makes reference to Scooby-Doo for some reason. I don't know. Uh, Coogan says so, so I'm just going to take his word. <laughs> but because of this, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the show as well as the character lacks self-identification. She herself is, I believe she's inspired by Van Helsing, the character from Dracula. And um, because of this, uh, because of this disconnect, because of this and because that you can place Buffy the Vampire Slayer within another genre, in this case the horror genre, or I suppose adventure genre. Because you can do that, and you can make a better argument for that than place her within the conventions of a superhero story, that means that it cannot be a superhero story. It does not belong in the superhero genre, as Coogan says so right there. Moving on to these conventions of the superhero genre. Um, in this case, I will talk a little bit about Jeffrey Brown's The Modern Superhero in Film and Television, a very fun book. Coogan says, once the conventions of a genre are enumerated, isolated, and reduced to the minimum, the definition of a genre and its hero can be adduced. So it's important to understand what these conventions are in order for us to define the superhero genre. Jeffrey A. Brown defines a superhero film to be about a traumatized but morally pure white American male becoming, becoming strong and powerful in order to exact his own personal revenge and to protect innocent lives, ultimately defeating a maniacal terrorist-like figure and saving an entire city from destruction. So, we'll now move on to, I believe, origin? Yes. Origin stories are in of itself a convention of the superhero genre, given that Especially when we look at movies, a lot of movies deal with the origin story of a superhero, whether it be the, uh, the re a reboot or a, f a remake or whatever. Um, Norval Lansky says that the problem with origin stories is that it takes away the spectacular element from the superhero character. It makes them relatable and uh, it makes them not as superheroic to us. We are dealing with a character who goes through a transformative trauma. Um, that's what he thinks is an issue with the origin story. Uh, and we will look a little bit more at that at the end of this part here. For now, we'll look, on, we'll look at Coogan's own conventions, what he believes a superhero story needs in order for it to be, as, to be that. Uh, we need a supervillain, we need a helpful authority figure, we need a sidekick, and we need a super team. To use an example here, Batman, once again, his supervillain is, of course, the Joker. Uh, I believe most people would argue that. A uh, helpful authority figure could be James Gordon. It could be Lucius Fox, if you look at Dark Knight. Uh, sidekick, I suppose Robin or Catwoman would be an example, or 
um, Batgirl again, no example. I suppose Alfred would even count to an extent. Super Team, well, I would say Super Team is, I would argue that Super Team is not always needed. I mean, if a story, if a superhero story is, is as Jeffrey Brown states, it's about a lonely white male uh, saving the day, then Super Teams may not always be part of the equation. But to go with Coogan's belief here, we might in this case say, well, Justice League would be a, a super team to that regard. All right, then we have some nice pictures here <laughs> <laughs> for masculinization by Scott Buchanan. Um, it deals with the concept of a physical transformation of the superhero. It is the moment where the super, where you might say the character becomes the superhero character. It is a physical transformation where they become muscular, as you might remember from Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. It's, it's a little off, cut off here, but you, I, I hope you can see all the glory here. <laughs> and if that's missing, we at least have Steve Rogers right up there to satisfy our need. What's interesting about this is how it actually relates to a term by Brown, hegemonic masculinity. Or it's, a, it's at least a term that I believe he talks about. It might not be him, but it's definitely in his book. So please correct me if it's wrong. Um, hegemonic masculinity deals with the idea of a character who's so masculine that they can overcome any other men, they can defeat any other men, and they can, uh, to an extent, defeat any other woman. They can have any woman that they want. Interestingly is that, me, for, for me, I would argue that it would be sort of a stereotype to consider the superhero character to be an example thereof. I would say, for me, when I think of a character who would fit that model, um, I would think of a character like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. Very masculine, has every man fall for him and adore him, along with every woman also be to his disposal, except for Belle, of course, but that's a different matter. But basically, masculinization means that they reach a level of masculinity that we might argue is hegemonic, they go from being feminine, unmanly characters to these hyper-masculine characters, as we can see here. They go from being the virgin to be the chat von der Kock, or whatever we would use to, whatever meme we would use to explain that. Okay, this is the part I was talking about earlier. Self-identification by Umberto Eco. What makes superhero stories appealing and what makes definitely the origin story of a superhero appealing, I would argue, is that we are capable of identifying, is that we, we, we're capable of relating to this, this character who goes through a lot of these uh, problems, goes through these conflicts. And Roberto Echo uses uh, Clark Kent as an example thereof by stating that Clark Kent is a relatable character because he himself is an ordinary man. We can understand that, we can follow that line of thought, but he can also become Superman. He can become something extraordinary. So if we can relate to Clark Kent, we can, we can imagine, we can, we, can, we can escape to that place where we can imagine that we too can one day become a superhero, a superman, you might say. I believe that's actually all the groundworks. So we will now move on to the analysis of the film itself. We will start off by taking the Joker character and putting him into the MPI model. Instead of starting off with mission, I will start off with identity, because identity is probably the one that he fits the most. So, let's see here. Um, this is what I would argue. When we talk about costume, well, it's the Joker. He looks like the Joker as we usually know him, except for the, the color scheme itself. I'll return to that. Then we have his code name. Well, that's the Joker, of course. Uh, or just more precisely, Joker, as it is said here by Murray Franklin in that one scene of the film. And then I would argue his chevron is actually the mask itself. It is a little bit funny because the mask is inspired by Arthur Fleck's uh, clown persona, uh, Carnival, I believe his name was. Um, but it's also what he sort of tries to look like when he tr makes his transformation into the Joker. When he colors his hair green, he looks at the green hair of this one. So I would argue that he attempts to replicate the chevron in a, in, in a way, and th th the mask in a way, and that's why I would argue that's the chevron. Returning to the colors. Um, I didn't notice this until I think my fourth time watching the film, but 
I didn't know why he was colored the way he was. Why, is, why does he look like, I always, I thought he looked like Ronald McDonald. I don't know why he wasn't just purple like we, like we know him to be. Until I noticed, it's probably because of the curtains from Murray Franklin's show, the ones that he emerges from. And I noticed that it's most likely the yellow and the red that inspired the color scheme of his, his, his suit here. Otherwise, the suit is basically as we know it from other source material. Speaking of Murray Franklin, he is also the one who names him. He's the one who refers to him as Joker. And Arthur Flex accepts that and uses and tells him, of course, when he comes on the show, and he tells him, when you bring me out, will you introduce me as Joker? So, Murray Franklin is the reason for why he's named Joker, and possibly his show is the reason for why he looks the way he does in his costume. What I'm trying to argue here is that the connection is Murray Franklin. And talking about Arthur Fleck's character, his intent to come on, he intended to come on the show in order to kill himself. As far as I can understand, that was his initial intent. But there was also some vengeance added to that because he was, he was not happy that Murray Franklin had made fun of him on the show. So you might say that he's, his motivation is uh, vengeance. When we look at this, we might say identity that's something we can definitely talk about when talking about the Joker. But does that make him a superhero? Well, let's look at mission. His mission is a bit muddled. Um, first of all, I thought that his mission is that he wants to be seen and he wants to make people laugh. So he wants to be seen. That sounds very selfish. That doesn't sound like what a superhero wants. As Coogan says, someone who does not act selfishly to aid others in times of need is not heroic and therefore not a hero. Therefore not a hero. But he also wants to make people laugh, and that sounds selfless enough. Interestingly, he achieves both things at the end of the film, when he's standing on top of the police car, and he's making the people happy as he's dancing, because, and he's happy himself because they are now noticing him. He has been noticed, he's been seen, he's been valued. But that's what I thought originally. And I started thinking, perhaps that's more the motivation of Arthur's character. I think the Joker himself, if you were to separate the two, I think the Joker doesn't have a motivation. Uh, sorry, I don't think he has a mission. Because he's the Joker. He never even wanted to create chaos. We can argue that he wanted to create chaos in a movie like The Dark Knight. But in this film, it doesn't seem to be his intent. It, it still happens. But it seems to just sort of, he just seems to sort of fall into this success. He fall he sort of failed upwards in a weird way. He even failed on the show and then somehow he failed on Murray Franklin's show and managed to get on the show himself. But regardless of his mission being a, a bit unclear, we can definitely say one thing. There is the scene in the film where we have the three uh, men on the train and there is they're harassing the woman. And she looks over at him, and he doesn't do anything. He just tries to look away. Then he starts laughing, and then they, of course, go after him. I would argue, had the scene played out in a way where, where Arthur, not Joker, but where Arthur had tried to intervene and tried to, had made the action of getting up and tried to stop them, tried to help the woman, we could talk about a very classic scenario of a superhero character. But he doesn't do that. And that returns again to Coogan's own little message here. Someone who does not act selflessly to aid others in time of need is not heroic and therefore not a hero. So I would argue because of this, it's difficult to consider him a hero as, uh, sorry, a superhero as he doesn't do something necessarily selfless in the film. And he always, for the whole film, seems to act uh, for his own interest. Okay, now we're gonna get weird. This is gonna be a little tangent of mine because we're gonna talk about his powers. I would first of all say that he doesn't have any superpowers per se. Well, Batman didn't have any superpowers either. However, as we all know from other versions of the Joker, he's a great manipulator. The Joker has been called one of the greatest unreliable narrators. If you look at examples like, uh, if you look at other examples like The Killing Joke or Mad Love, the, um, both the comic book and the TV show episode where he where we get to know the uh, story of how he met Harley Quinn and he told her lies of his upbringing. 
Dark Knight, do you know how I got these scars? Something that all these stories have in common is that he always presents himself in the story as a sympathetic character. It's the same thing for this film. And my argument is that, this is, this is gonna sound weird, but my argument is, and this, is that the, the character and the film tries to manipulate us into liking him. When we get to the end of the film, he is, la sorry, when, he, when we get to the end of the film, after he said he wouldn't get the joke, he starts singing That's Life, the song, as it's playing uh, non diegetically meaning that it, it's not playing from a source within the scene, it just starts playing on the soundtrack of the film. And he's singing along to it. He's breaking the fourth wall. It's almost as if he is self-aware that he doesn't quite fit within this film. And we know he's an unreliable narrator within the film given the uh, interaction he has with his neighbor and the reveal that they would never had a relationship with each other. Something I want to point out here is that the Joker and Arthur Fleck has, has been presented very sympathetically throughout the whole film. Given how we never get to see them murder anyone who did not deserve it, let's put it that way. When he murders, when he murders someone, it's someone who either abused him, mistreated him, or betrayed him to some extent. The one exception, maybe, is the neighbor. And I say that because we don't get to see what happens with her. We understand that the scene between them ends with him uh, pointing the uh, gun at his, his head and she looks scared. And then it clips to him out of the apartment and walking away. Then he's sitting in his own apartment, having a cigarette, laughing in his underwear while the police car drives by outside. And we never get to see the neighbor again. We can never get to see the neighbor. We never get to see a kid again. They're out of the movie. Why? Did he kill them? My argument is that he killed them. Because if he didn't kill them, it wouldn't make sense to just cut to that and not show us what happened to them. So my argument is that he did murder them. But I also acknowledge that it's possible that he didn't. But by not showing us that, by intentionally not showing us that, he's not giving us a reason for us to dislike him. If we had seen him kill her, it might give us a reason to no longer be on his side and be sympathetic towards him. We can even understand him when he murders his own mother for what she did to him as a kid. And we can even possibly understand to an extent when he murders Murray Franklin for making fun of him. It's interesting how that plays out. But if it had been shown that he murdered the neighbor who had done nothing to him, arguably betrayed him by not being a part of his fantasy and actually having her own life, but arguably not. By not showing us that, we have a reason to still like him. What I want to go <laughs> explain with this whole rant, and I warned you this was a tangent, is um, when we're talking about his powers in the film, I would argue in, um, in a very meta way he does have powers, and his powers are to manipulate people. And as much as it is to influence others, uh, given his interaction with the, uh, the clown movement that appears in the film. However, I don't think that's very superhero-like, so that's another reason to not consider him a superhero. Then we have the conventions. First of all, it is an origin story. We, uh, we get to see his origin. We get to see how he became the Joker, how he, what, what all the horrible things that happened to him that made him the way he is. And then he became a superhero, so to speak. So it's definitely an origin story about a tragic character. Coogan's conventions do not apply. There's no clear supervillain. There's no helpful authority figure. There is no sidekick, there is no super team. We might argue that Thomas Wayne can be considered a supervillain, but I think that's a bit of a stretch. We might argue the same for um, Gary being a sidekick, but that's still a little bit uh. We might make the argument that the movie seems to be aware of these conventions of the typical superhero film, but I don't think it completely follows them. Thus, it is difficult to really say that the film belongs in the superhero genre, and it's probably more likely to consider it a drama or a thriller, given its heavy influences by Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy. If you have not seen The King of, how many have seen The King of Comedy? No one. 
The King of Comedy is a movie about a man who wants to be a comedian, who lives with his mother, who is fascinated by a talk show host, who has heavy hallucinations, and also is in love with a black girl. It's very, <laughs> I mean, there is paying homage, and then there is, eh. uh, but that's my personal opinion. Um, what I want to say with all that is because it draws these heavy influences from uh, both films, uh, it's my argument that it's difficult to consider the superhero film as it lacks this own identity. And therefore, it's probably more like the drama thriller. We can place it within drama thriller, we can consider it a character study, but I do not think we can, at least according to Kukin, consider it completely as a superhero story. Then we move on to masculinization. That's an interesting point, because as we talked about, typically a superhero will become more masculine. They'll make this muscular transition. The Joker arguably becomes feminine, in my opinion. There's already written a lot about, I don't know if you're familiar with queer coding, but it's basically the idea of taking ideas of um, homosexuals and um, applying them to a character in order to make them um, feminine, in order to make them, um, speaking from a very homophobic point of view, as I would say queer coding is, make them repulsive. Make it clear that they're supposed to be the villain. You might say Scar is in, from, from Disney movies, and a lot of Disney villains are an examples of queer coding. And something that's been done a lot with the Joker, and usually when we see it, it's actually in a story with Batman. Batman, who would then be this hyper-masculine uh, character that he would stand in complete contrast to. And I believe, I forget her name, but I read this one person who wrote a, a thesis about how, in her opinion, the, the fear a reader has when they're reading a story with Batman the Joker is not whether or not Joker would kill Batman, but whether or not he would make him gay. <laughs> Which is outrageous. <laughs> and something we, we have to point out also about queer coding, I'll finish it up quickly, is that uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the character is homosexual themselves. That's actually how messed up it is. Uh, the Joker, of course, has Harley Quinn, so we might say, well, she's not, he's not homosexual, um, as we know him. Um, but um, it's also, like, like I said, queer coding doesn't necessarily suggest their uh, sexuality. It is purely just little signifiers that we recognize that have been added to this uh, character for the sake of making them repulsive, for the sake of making them villain, villainous, for the sake of making so that we do not like them. I would argue he becomes more feminine when he is the Joker. You see the way he holds his cigarette, you see the way he's crossing his legs, his whole movement, body movement itself is very feminine, very flamboyant. The way he sits with his shoulder when he's talking to Mary Franklin, he's very feminine. But if you're going to consider him as a queer coded character, why? why? Why why does he act like that? Is it possible to say that the idea is that he's meant to be like, you know, since he's now full on Joker, are we to understand it as, oh, it's like a metaphor for like being out of the closet. So is it supposed to be positive? I would say it's not, because he's also been stated to be a character who is mentally uh, insane, mentally ill, and when you have a sentence with words like mentally ill and homosexual in the same sentence, it's uh, very, very negative. So I would say that it, I, I just want to point this all out to say that it's an interesting observation that they made him that way. But certainly not masculine at all. He stays the same skinny man as he does throughout the whole film. Therefore, not a superhero in the same case. I forgot to mention earlier that the mas masculinization can also happen to a supervillain but it doesn't seem to apply to this character again. So once again, another argument for why we can say that he's not a superhero. Now we have self-identification, and that's the one thing that we, that's really interesting when looking at the Joker. Because as it's written here, Arthur Fleck is a mentally ill loner mistreated by his society who becomes capable of lashing back against it. What I'm trying to say is we as viewers can definitely, to an extent, relate to this character in a similar way, possibly, to how we can relate to Clark Kent. And I find that interesting, given that throughout a lot of this, I have made arguments for why I would say that he is not a uh, superhero. He's still identifiable, to an extent, 
even though he's presented to be mentally ill, or even though it's explained that he's mentally ill, we can understand a lot of his character, despite him not being a superhero. And we might say, because he's not a superhero, or because of the reasons in the film, we have reason to not root for him throughout the, the movie. So, we get to the end here. The conclusion that I have written here is that Joker 2019 is a drama thriller about a character known to be a supervillain in comic books. And because of that, it is therefore not to be considered a superhero uh, film, at least according to uh, Coogan's idea. Uh, the character is closer to what uh, Coogan refers to as an inverted superhero supervillain, which is, he actually uses the Joker and also Catwoman as an example of that. An inverted superhero supervillain is a, is a type of villain who actually got their own MPI model. The only difference there is that the mission that they would have is uh, for a selfish reason opposed to a selfless reason. Um, that would explain why the identity part seemed to fit um, for the Joker in this film. <coughs> and then I want to get on to, oh yeah, they can become good guys like, um, and he mentions an example like, I think, uh, Hawkeye and Black Widow uh, from Marvel comic books, as ex other examples of inverted superhero supervillains. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to here is supervillains suppose any form of authority and attempt to revolutionize the status quo. And Arthur does both of those. And Richard Reynolds says the villains are concerned with change and the heroes with maintenance of the status quo. And I agree with that. However, and this is what's interesting, the status quo in Joker is that Gotham is uh, suffering. Gotham is getting crazy, while the rich don't care. The one percenters, as they seem to be presented as. And there are strikes going on, there is trash and garbage everywhere. There's super rats, as they explain on the news. That is the status quo of this universe. And arguably, the actions of uh, Arthur, as well as Joker, seems to change that. Seems to at least give them a reason to go against that. Seems to fight back, in a way. So in and in of itself, they can, the clown movement, we can talk about self-identification with their look at uh, Joker. Uh, very much so, given the makeup, of course. Uh, what, may the, what may make the character appear to be a superhero is that a viewer can identify himself with Arthur, similar to Clark Kent. One may argue that uh, Joker functions similar to a reversed Batman and that he changes the status quo, which is damaging to a majority of Gotham. How, yeah, however closing statement, Joker's not a superhero, right. Um, what I just want to finish off with all this is that while Coogan has made a lot of, like, given our arguments from Coogan, we have a lot of reasons to claim that Joker is not a superhero. But what's interesting about this here, the villains are concerned with chains and the heroes with the maintenance of the status quo. Knowing that the status quo is problematic and hurtful in the film, we might make the argument that while uh, Joker is, of, uh, while, while we may not consider him a superhero, he may still be considered a heroic character. And we may even say that while he is definitely a messed up character, and while we can even, we can even make the argument that he is a form of anti, an anti-hero, I believe, um, we would still have to acknowledge that the film itself uh, definitely deals with a world that is even worse. The surrounding world seems to be worse than Arthur himself, we could argue. However, we need to remember, of course, that um, a lot of this film seems to be done from the perspective of Arthur. There is this idea that if you look at all the clocks in the film, this all says the same thing. And there's this idea that he never leaves that uh, room that he's in at the end of the film. The whole film takes place in the form of a flashback and a retelling of events. So we can't really go with what he's saying. And like I said, he's an unreliable uh, narrator. And we know that he's the one telling the story because he's our, uh, he's our focalization for the whole film. He's our point of view. Everything we see is from his perspective, with the one exception being the murder of uh, Bruce Wayne's parents, of course. Um, so while he's definitely not a superhero character as Coogan would define him, and even other, even further case with Jeffrey Brown, um, and while the movie itself is definitely not what I would consider a 
an example of a superhero uh, film itself, I would say that it seems to be something new that could possibly lead to a new type of genre in superhero films. However, it does also take a lot of inspiration from Taxi Driver and King of Comedy because it's, it takes a lot of inspiration from King of Comedy and uh, Taxi Driver. We may argue that this is not anything new. I would say that he's not a superhero, but that may not be that much of a bad thing. And perhaps he is a new type of heroic character, uh, the type of character that works within the setting of his uh, film. So these are my works cited in case uh, you have any interest, in case you're interested in looking it up. And uh, yeah, I would just like to say uh, thank you all for, for coming. And uh, you're free to stay for the discussion that, like I said, will be in the in Danish. So thank you very much.